including infrastructure and rolling stock, so a very well-rounded career. Um, he retired in 2008, and since 2010, he has been writing for Rail Engineer and is currently the editor. Um, so, and David is going to talk to us this evening about the Network Rail Traction uh, Network Decarbonisation Study and his review of that, that um, and, and sort of put some of his thoughts across um, on, on that particular piece of work. So, handing over David to you, if I may. You need to unmute yourself, David. Sorry about that. Right. Can anybody see that? Uh, I'm take that as the case. Yes. Uh, as Rachel says, I've, I've been involved uh, writing for Real Engineer for a while, and my interest in this particular topic started at the uh, Railway Challenge, an excellent event. In 2012, I saw the UK's first hydrogen train which I thought was that's kind of very interesting, but maybe it'll never catch on. Uh, and I must say, I, if you told me then that five years later, I will be on a press visit to see Alstom's Island uh, about to enter service as contracts have been signed for it, I would have been amazed. And that's all down to the development in fuel cells uh, since since the turn of the century, which has uh, increased in, incredibly in, in terms of power output and efficiency. Uh, but let's look at the big picture. Uh, in terms of our overall emissions, hydrogen, uh, transport is the worst problem. And it's actually far worse than government figures show it because government figures tend not to show international, uh, even though all the fuel for international flights and such like comes from the UK. And transport, if, if nothing else, its emissions is actually rising. And one of the things I think is quite interesting is if you look at the UK energy flow chart, you can see how petroleum dominates that and it dominates it for transport and it's quite interesting if we look at it in terms of terawatt hours we produce currently 350 terawatt hours of electricity uh, and use for transport 640 terawatt hours of petroleum and if we're to decarbonize we've basically got to power things by electricity so that's quite a challenge uh, and to give an idea of, of how much more efficient electric vehicles are. If we take the big picture of fleet sizes and energy use of the electric fleet and the diesel fleet, uh, and you sort of crank a spreadsheet, uh, it's clear that uh, diesels per vehicle have got about a quarter the energy efficiency of electrics. And that includes things like idling and, and such like. Uh, but I mean, that just shows the benefits of electric traction, which I'm sure most of us all know. Uh, the other thing that I think is really quite interesting, and I didn't know this until recently, is actually how bad the UK, UK rail compares in the decarbonisation ranks compared with all the railways, uh, because we have a particularly high percentage of uh, diesel usage uh, for our energy, as you can see from those graphs. Uh, we're one of the worst in terms of freight, even worse than the USA. Uh, and uh, pretty poor in terms of passenger emissions. because those figures were per passenger kilometre, so those relate to pre-COVID, but even so, it just shows what having such an intensively used diesel service actually means in terms of carbon emissions. Uh, looking to the future, uh, energy flow scenarios that have been projected if we're going to get to net zero uh, is there, and I show that graph for two reasons. One is to show that there is a need for other things than electricity. Biofuels have got their place, but strictly limited uh, because it, it, it's a finite resource in the future will be biofuels. And hydrogen is needed for, for flexibility in some form because uh, you can't plug ev power everything by electricity. And we can debate exactly how much that should be. Uh, and the other thing about that, if you compare those two charts, is how much more efficient an all electric uh, future would be. Uh, and I'm sure this is being recorded and you can, you can study those yourself later. I'll obviously not go over all those, but it, it does show a future, if we're gonna to get to this decarbonization, that is much more energy efficient, but it does need electricity production to be doubled 
and a significant amount of hydrogen production. So let's talk about the various options. Electrification. Uh, electrification is the only high-powered zero carbon transport technology. And that's because the problem with electricity is you can transmit it over long distances, but only to fixed locations. And an electric railway, of course, has got a fixed current collection system. Uh, that, those, that's no surprise, I suspect, to most people here. Uh, the problem I think the rail industry has got is convincing decision makers of those basic facts. And hence the Traction Decarbonisation Network Strategy, which is a good piece of work, albeit a bit lengthy, uh, concluded that if you're going to look at the end solution to 2050, electrification is the solution. It's really a no-brainer, uh, but it goes into great detail and spells out the benefits, a range of various options. And interestingly, uh, provided that you can deliver electrification in a cost-effective manner, which is actually now happening, electrification is also profitable. Everyone talks about the cost of electrification, but you're actually investing to, uh, to save money and, with a good business case. Scotland similarly uh, has got a plan to decarbonise. The only difference between the Scotland's plan and the Network Rail plan is they're actually implementing it. And what's interesting in Scotland is it's been in implemented by an integrated team and how electrification is a catalyst for other things like the enhancements that need to be done beforehand, such as gauge clearance and all the rest of it, and most importantly, an integrated rolling stock strategy. And in Scotland, they're actually developing an integrated electrification and rolling stock strategy, uh, which is something that will need to be developed south of the border. So that's, electrification's got obvious benefits and I'm not gonna dwell on that. Let's talk about some of the alternatives. Let's talk about hydrogen trains. Uh, hydrogen trains, Alstom Lint is now in service in Germany. Uh, it can be regarded as pretty much a mature technology. Uh, the UK has got problems of a constrained loading gauge. And so where you put the hydrogen, which takes up a lot of space, is clearly a problem. Uh, <coughs> looking at the big picture, rail is a bit player. Uh, trains have got uh, the future demand for hydrogen for trains will be a fraction that potentially of HGVs and buses. Uh, but the thing about rail is that it's got a longer vehicle life, so rail perhaps needs to start soon. But there is a lot of potential to benefit from synergies in, in other sectors. Uh, you can see there, you know, development of hydrogen traction. I mentioned the railway challenge, uh, Alstom's Island into service to September 18, uh, which is essentially uh, a uh, hydrogen battery hybrid. Uh, and it, and it the, cl the really clever and demanding bit is to actually balance the fuel cell output with your battery output and also taking on board regeneration into your batteries, etc. cetera. Uh, Alstom uh, have got a proposal for fleet operation and really, you know, the technology is tried, but how it works in fleet operation is one of the things that needs to be found out. And they have a concept that gives you a thousand kilometre range, but due to the UK loading, UK loading gauge, the hydrogen tanks have got to be inside the train. The efficiency of hydrogen, the wheel to well, uh, is of the order of about 30%, which is pretty much the same as, a, uh, as an, ex well, it's of the same order uh, as a diesel train, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but that's uh, a significant factor but the question is, is that a problem? Uh, there's a few things that need to be considered. Overnight wind power uh, is one. You know, you can actually use unwanted electricity to generate hydrogen. I am told that actually there are investment constraints on uh, renewable energy and wind power because there's insufficient uh, guaranteed demand in the way that hydrogen train hydrogen would provide that demand. And the other interesting thing is price and price certainty. The thing about hydrogen is its price is essentially the cost of the kit, the cost of your electrolysis plant, the cost of your uh, wind turbine. You need to service that capital, you need to maintain it. But interestingly, uh, one of Alstom's recent ordered included fuel for 25 years. 
I mean, we all know about maintenance being included with uh, uh, with, uh, with, with the supply of new trains, but supplying fuel is, is quite extraordinary. And Alstom would not obviously include that in their deal unless there was price certainty. Uh, so that's probably a much more bigger factor than the efficiency thing. How do we supply hydrogen uh, to our trains? Do we do it through pipelines? tankers and bear in mind that because of the density of uh, hydrogen uh, you uh, you would need 12 times as many fuel tankers to supply hydrogen by road as, as by diesel or by electricity and bear in mind hydrogen is an energy vector you can make it from electricity and almost certainly the answer is for back to base operations where you're operating your trains from one place to, to supply your hydrogen effectively by electricity and convert it there and the model for that is uh, what was, uh, I understand at the time, uh, Europe's uh, largest hydrogen uh, refueling station uh, in Aberdeen for its uh, hydrogen bus uh, pilot. And that's what was involved in that, a 1.5 million plant, uh, which needed a one megawatt electricity supply, a reasonable supply of water, and roughly speaking, to supply a fleet of 10 trains, you could scale that up to 10 times the size of that. And that's a scalable technology, which the Aberdeen pilot concluded was quite a mature technology. And it also offers grid balancing opportunities, which is again, part one of the synergies. Hydrogen storage is the problem. Uh, there's various ways of storing hydrogen. Uh, currently compressed at 350 bar is the answer. And that takes up 7% of the energy of the hydrogen. Uh, it's a bit more complex and challenging to store it at twice that uh, and you're losing more uh, energy loss. Uh, space rockets store hydrogen as liquid fuel at 20 degrees above zero. Uh, I know that's really practical for trains. Uh, liquid ammonia is one way of storing hydrogen and that's a potential for shipping, uh, but maybe not, uh, maybe not on trains. Uh, so hydrogen storage is, is a constraint. No doubt about that. And as can be seen on that, that shows if we look at both hydrogen and batteries, the top graph is percentage of interior space and compared with diesels, you need a lot more space. And if we look in terms of weight, hydrogen and, and diesel is about the same, but batteries are very heavy. Uh, and talking about batteries, batteries certainly have got their uh, option. I mean, there are talks to uh, run <coughs> relatively short distances off the wire, say Azuma to Lincoln, et cetera. Viva Rail have got, uh, they reckon they can manage 60 miles currently on their battery range. Uh, they've got quite an interesting fast charging system that will charge the batteries in seven minutes, uh, which might work in some situations, but generally branch line. Uh, one of the things that I often worry about is that there's a billion cars in the world and uh, if they all get converted into batteries, what's that going to do to the cost of batteries? But who knows what the future is going to bring? But certainly batteries in the MUs could facilitate a steady rolling program of electrification. Uh, what I've been talking about so far is the end state, you know, what we need to get to net zero. But the transition is the really difficult bit. Uh, what we do with our existing diesel trains and such like, that's... There's so many options, dual fuel, bi-modes, uh, diesel battery hybrids, and, and discontinuous electrification. Uh, interestingly, in Scotland, uh, one of the uh, conclusions of the rolling stock strategy is that they will, to actually get to a fully electrified railway, have an intermediate stage with uh, battery EMUs, which will, in the end, in the long term, be then converted into uh, back into EMUs. Uh, so there's some interesting work to be done on de decarbonisation transitional strategies there. Uh, I'll just talk on one thing, which is the Azumas, the, the bi-modes, if you like, which uh, certainly uh, are not an ideal train in the sense that you're carrying a lot of excess weight along. But as an intermediate thing, and it's actually potentially quite useful. Uh, for example, the Azumas running to Inverness or use, produce a third of the carbon of the HSTs they replace because obviously you're doing a lot more running under the wires. And also 
buy more trains do give you traction flexibility to facilitate a rolling program of electrification. So what is the future traction mix? Uh, well, the answer is lots of electrification, some hydrogen and some batteries. Nobody knows exactly what the right mix is gonna be because none of us really know what the future is, uh, but we really need to get started and, and find out. Uh, and thank you for listening. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, David. Let me just see if I can get my video up. There we go, that's it. Thanks for that, excellent. So um, what we'll do now is if you can save your questions for David until, um, until the end when we do the panel, uh, please. So I'm gonna move on now um, to Steve um, Sapsford's presentation. So as I said earlier, Steve um, is currently chair of the IMEQ's um, Powertrain Systems and Fuel Group um, and has been um, on uh, the, uh, a response from the IMEQE to the government's consultation on phasing out internal combustion engines by 2035. Um, Steve um, joined, uh, worked for 32 years at Ricardo um, and put this sort of various technical roles, mainly uh, propulsion engineer um, and various management roles. And in 2018 left to form his own consultancy to the automotive and motorsport um, industry. So uh, Steve is gonna to talk to us about um, sustainable fuels um, and a potential application um, in rail as well. So Steve, handing over to you, please. Excellent, thanks very much for that introduction and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, as you can tell, I'm the interloper here. Um, most of this work was all that I'm gonna talk about has been focused on light duty, but I have tried to in in insert some of my thoughts as a non-rail expert on potential for sustainable fuels. Um, so we're just, just going to run through very quickly. There's a lot to get through, but you need to have it all in order to have the story. Um, I've already hit a couple of slides because David's covered those, so that's great. But compelling need for action. I really want to start with life cycle analysis, uh, what sustainable fuels are out there. This issue about the existing vehicle part, what's out on the, on the roads right now, and the same for what's out on the tracks right now what those applications for sustainable fuels in rail might be and some, some conclusions and recommendations. Um, the compelling need for action basically just says that the current trajectory that we're on in terms of greenhouse gas emissions uh, versus where we need to be for uh, a two degree or a one and a half degree uh, temperature increase uh, basically means there's a disconnect. And so uh, we, there's either going to be some huge environmental disruption or we're gonna to have to have some form of economic disruption in order to drive us down onto the lower trajectory. Um, David showed very effectively what that uh, split was for road transport and that's an area that we've, um, for transport generally, and that's an area we've got to go at. Um, there are two ways really to con reduce um, CO2 emissions uh, for a vehicle. It doesn't matter what sort of vehicle it is. First thing we can do is improve the vehicle efficiency. Uh, and the second one is reduce the amount of carbon in the fuel. Um, so all the stuff across the top is what um, typical uh, engine guys are fretting about all the time in terms of reducing friction and reducing weight and all those sorts of things. But what we're going to talk about this evening is the bottom stuff. Um, so this is you know, reducing the carbon in the fuel, which can take the form of low carbon electricity, uh, synthetic biofuels and e-fuels, and also uh, hydrogen. And it's those two that we're going to concentrate on this evening. I do want us to also take a step back uh, and look at life cycle analysis, because this is a very important aspect and the kind of foundation of everything that we are wearing an IMEC e hat put into our uh, white paper back in January 2020 and our response to the OLEV consultation. Um, and I would I'm sure a lot of you know about it, but I'm just gonna mention it now. It, this is automotive focus, but it applies to any product basically. Uh, and what this is really trying to do is take into account the overall CO2 impact uh, through the entire life cycle of a particular product, starting from digging raw materials out of the ground, such as iron ore, uh, processing those into a roll of sheet steel, turning that into a car or a train, uh, and then using that um, throughout its life and refueling it and whatever fuel you're using. And then at the end, the disposal stroke recycling, 
And of course, you need to take into account the fuel that you're using uh, and the life cycle will do, analysis will do all of that. Um, the in-use part often referred to as tank to wheel and then the uh, generation of the fuel manufacturing of that fuel, be it electricity or uh, fossil based oil or uh, fossil based fuels or uh, renewable fuels is the well to tank bit. But uh, a lot of the production stuff is outside that loop. But currently this that highlighted area, that's the only part considered in our current legislative framework from a passenger car perspective. Uh, and so all the focus has been on zero emissions and you'll see it written all over cars, etc. It's really zero tailpipe emissions or zero emissions at point of use. In reality, a lot of this CO2 is like a bar of soap. You squeeze it in this place, it just pops out somewhere else on that chart. It just happens we're not measuring it, we're not looking, uh, and so it can get discounted and can actually be worse. So well, actually, what, what happens if you do do the sums for a life cycle analysis? Um, this is some work that uh, Audi did, uh, VW uh, Audi Group did, looking at uh, all of the different propulsion systems for a, a typical C-class vehicle, golf-sized uh, vehicle. Um, the, the faint numbers in grey are, are kind of where we are now. It's the ones in colours, which is their projection into 2030. Uh, and these are the CO2 in terms of grams per kilometre coming from in use uh, and also all the production and the production of the fuel amortised over the life of the vehicle, which in this case is assumed to be 200,000 kilometres. So what you can see there are the different fuels and the totals I've just put up there for gasoline, diesel, uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, battery electric vehicle and a fuel cell electric vehicle. Um, and um, those are the kind of, this is where all of the fuels are coming from at the moment or in the next few years. So you'll look, for example, the fuel cell electric vehicle is, is not particularly good at the moment uh, because we're recognising that most of the commercially available hydrogen comes from uh, steam methane reformation, so it's effectively a fossil fuel. And there's virtually no carbon capture really going on at the moment that could turn that brown or grey hydrogen into, into uh, blue hydrogen. Or well, however, um, you yeah, see so that's outrageous, isn't it? Surely we'll be all using green hydrogen. Okay, so what happens if we let everything go to uh, fully renewable sources? So down the bottom, you see that's my um, uh, hydrogen from electrolysis powered by 100% renewables. Uh, makes a big difference. Uh, you look at the battery electric vehicle running on green electricity compared to the sort of average EU mix. Then also have a look at what happens to all the other powertrains as well when we're running those on um, uh, e-gasoline, e-diesel or green electricity and e-gasoline or diesel for the plug-in hybrid. I'll just take the others away just for so you can see and effectively there's no real obvious winner. Uh, in this study they didn't take into account any improvements in production um, but it is reasonable to say that yes, they would improve, but there's no reason to assume that production will favour any particular uh, powertrain over any uh, others, so that they should uh, um, reduce in, in a similar fashion. So now we're down to the odds of 50 grams per kilometre compared to the 100 odd that we were at before. But, um, that just shows the comparison. Another way of looking at it, uh, Polestar, uh, which is the sort of EV part of Volvo, published their life cycle analysis for the new Polestar 2, which was great. Uh, they've done it in a slightly different way. They compared the Polestar 2 with different electricity mixes and um, the XC40 powered by an internal combustion engine. It's interesting, everybody usually compares to internal combustion engine as opposed to a hybrid or a plug-in hybrid. They're always kind of left off. But in this case, similar story. So this is effectively for the conventionally fueled vehicle. So you can see the production, the sort of total tons of CO2 from production here. And then uh, based on the, the um, 100 and something grams per kilometre, over 200,000 kilometres, then this is what you get in terms of your total tonnage of CO2. Um, for the uh, Polestar 2, you see a significant increase because of the embedded carbon in the vehicle manufacturer that we short saw on the previous slide. Most of that is down to the manufacturer of the battery pack and most of that is down to the manufacturer of, of, of the cells. 
uh, we bear in mind where those cells are predominantly coming from, um, then you know, with a usually much worse electricity mix than, than we have, this is why you get a significant increase. Um, if we run that on a, an average European mix, um, then uh, obviously we're producing less CO2 and clearly on a renewable uh, grid, then we are pretty flat. There's always some losses involved. And then they effectively say these are the break even points. So uh, if you're running fully renewable, you'll have to drive the electric vehicle for 50,000 kilometers before you're, um, you're, you're better off uh, on the EU mix. Um, it's at 75,000 kilometers ish and 110,000 kilometers. So you can see how sensitive all of this is. And the one thing that um, I didn't put on there was uh, what the renewable fuels would do. But I did just want to show this is the, the, the scale of the challenge. So I made this an energy density barometer. D David touched on some of this, but I'd like to put it in a, in a sort of simple graphic. Uh, so this is the energy density in kilowatt hours per kilogram. So this is just gravimetric, not looking at uh, volumetric. This is where lithium ion batteries are, the sort of 250 to 300 watt hours per kilogram. Then we get to hydrogen um, at 700 bar. Um, and including the tank, I'll mention that in a minute. Um, CNG, LNG, bioethanol, biodiesel, uh, and then the bio, the gasolines, diesels, kerosenes, biomass to liquids, HVO, and biogasolines, and things like that. So you can see this is the scale of the challenge of why you know, David was showing that we need um, it's it's a lot more mass carrying around some of these other fuels and can be a lot more volume. The hydrogen one is important uh, because a lot of folks will talk about hydrogen having three times the energy density of gasoline rather than a quarter that I'm showing on this chart. Um, it would be on this chart 34 kilowatts per kilogram. Technically, that's correct, but it's not really usable. It's not available in that form. You have to stick it in a tank and you need to take that tank into account. Um, and roughly for a 700 bar system, for something in a Toyota Mirai, for example, carries five kilograms of, of hydrogen for about a 500 mile range. Uh, the tank weighs in excess of 100 kilos. These are just some of the routes to sustainable fuels. I'm not going to go through all of these. I just wanted to split them out. But down the bottom is sort of the conventional biofuels. Um, sugar, corn, sugar and corn are uh, um, first generation, and that's where we get into the argument about land use change, and food versus fuels. And most work now in biofuels is going on in advanced biofuels, which are using wastes. Could be waste oils, could be agricultural waste, could be forestry waste. Um, in the middle then, oh, so towards the top is the synthetic fuels, which are usually coming from municipal solid waste or biomass. Uh, and the, I'm getting a lot of other noise here as, as somebody trying to draw my attention. No, Steve, it's whoever's logged in as... Oh, thank you, they've sorted it now. <laughs> right, OK, so I thought you were trying to yell at me. Um, they go through the synthetic fuel route where effectively they are being used to, through, effectively to create a syngas and to then go through the fission trotch type reactions. And then at the top, we've got e-fuels. Um, well, these are the ones that are using uh, electrolysis or, or renewable energy um, from renewable energy to provide hydrogen and then using CO2 either for a direct air capture, industrial flue gases, biomasses, or something like that to, to create to create those fuels. The hydrogen, of course, doesn't have to go into a hydrocarbon fuel. It can be used directly. Um, it can go through a Harbour Bosch process to be making ammonia. But through all of those different processes, which are all at different states of maturity, and certainly all at different levels of, um, of uh, greenness, shall we say, um, uh, can be used, and that's what we looked at in our in our IMEC study. The important thing about the synthetic fuel route and the renewable fuels is is, a, is the is the park the existing park. So this is new uh, car registrations in 2020 by vehicle type. Uh, in all, 11 and a half million vehicles sold in vehicles uh, in 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 Europe. 
And there was a big shift this year um, in terms of battery electric. Normally that's down in the one on a bit percent. Um, and this year was 5.6%. Some of that was a manifestation of odd type because these are vehicle registrations um, and most of the electric vehicles are on quite long order uh, order time. So it just happened that orders made in 2019 were delivered in 2020. Uh, so there's a bit of a distortion from that effect, but even so, a lot more electric vehicles. However, when you look at that in the total uh, vehicle park, um, they haven't updated the 2020 figures yet, but for 2019, that's about 280 million vehicles. Then uh, battery electric is 0.2% of the fleet. Uh, and our question at the IMAQ was, so we're, we're just going to sit on our hands then, are we, and do nothing about the 280 million vehicles? That figures about 34 million vehicles just in the UK. Uh, and we're just going to wait till 2035 and hope electricity is going to fix everything. Yes, the trajectory is right, but we really need to do something about this now. So we went and did uh, a load of modelling work, um, commissioned Ricardo to, to do that because they do most of this work for the European Commission already and looked at two scenarios. Uh, one was the ZEV scenario, uh, which was assuming we could only sell battery electric vehicles or fuel cell vehicles uh, from 2035. Remember, this is our response to the consultation. So this predates the, the, the output of this. And we put forward an alternative scenario that said, don't ban internal combustion engines, uh, keep them, but probably as plug-in hybrids and also your BEVs and your fuel cell vehicles from 2035. And when you do that, and use renewable fuels, um, then actually you turn out with a slightly better solution. It's only just when you look at the scales, but it's at least as good um, and actually offers the consumer a much, much more managed transition to be to BEVs because they go through a plug-in hybrid on the way. It turns out to be quite a bit cheaper because you avoid quite a lot of the infrastructure, electrical infrastructure you need in remote places and things like that, and enables you to manage the building of that infrastructure uh, much more proactively. So, um, yes, yeah, so, sorry, I probably should have highlighted those we went. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the alternative scenario were very slightly lower uh, when you look at it in terms of the, the cumulative, though they're very, very similar, um, to be perfectly honest. Uh, however, um, in the scale you're looking at, you're still talking about 250 million tonnes of CO2 at less um, as a result of going through the alternative scenario. So I then had to think about how might this fit for rail. Uh, and I look, thought about each of these. I'm not a rail expert, and therefore there'll be all sorts of reasons why this is wrong, but hopefully gives you some thoughts. You talked about long life rolling stock and keeping them going. Um, everybody thinking ahead to battery electric and hydrogen, all of those require investment. Um, and uh, in particular, hydrogen requires a lot of infrastructure. Why can't we use what we've got now and start making a difference in that? right now. So um, there are some replacement fuels, sustainable fuels that you can use right now uh, in your ICE. So you can run with the FAME, which is a biodiesel, but it's first generation. So you are, you, you, you're you struggling with this food versus fuel thing, but HVO, hydrogenated or hydro-treated vegetable oil, uh, can be a second generation advanced biofuel. It's drop-in fuel, the same energy density as diesel. You can run it in the existing engines with no modifications, use the existing infrastructure and start reducing the CO2 right now. Uh, the problem is it does still emit a point of use. Yeah, so it's that whole thing about drawing the box, where's your system boundary? But that is already recycled carbon, so that should be taken into account. It does depend on the feedstocks though you use for your HVO, so it could be of mixed benefit if it's not coming from uh, particular sources. The FAME route does require some modification to the engine. It is slightly less energy dense uh, than the diesel and um, there are issues around the storage and, and, and the bunkering. But you know, this will be a much faster and cost effective route and certainly a transition technology to, to really help rail make a difference now. 
Um, there's the buy me thing, right? We talked, um, you know, there's been quite a lot of work on converting to CNG and even LNG. Um, so this does have a lower natural, uh, lower energy density, uh, primarily due to the to the fact we've got heavier tanks to store it in. But you can convert the existing engines to run on um, natural gas, uh, and they do produce less carbon emissions at point of use than uh, than the diesel. Uh, but it does still emit at point of use, uh, and you're going to have to use more of it. It does require high high pressure storage. Um, and so, you know, there is some cost of, uh, associated with the infrastructure. Um, finally, I did put in the synthetic and liquid, uh, synthetic diesels and e-diesels. So these are drop-in fuels using the sort of kind of top half of my picture um, in the synthetic fuel pathways. Um, they're dropping and so you can just use them right now. The problem is that there just isn't any of this stuff available in decent quantities. Um, so we, that needs investment to scale up to improve efficiency. The round trip efficiency for uh, an e-fuel is not that good, um, but it still might be effective. Um, if you can electrify, then that's the best thing you can do from an efficiency point of view, as, as David said. But where you can't, this might be the right thing to do. And it's certainly a very good method of storing excess energy. I looked at hydrogen. Whenever people talk about hydrogen, they automatically assume fuel cells. There are other ways of using the hydrogen. Um, so a fuel cell, yes, zero emissions at point of use and can be zero if the hydrogen is renewable. But it does require high pressure storage with a relatively poor energy density, better than a lithium ion battery, yes. Uh, but a lot of the hydrogen around now comes from fossil sources. It's space hungry, as David mentioned, and you know, it's not been running around for 25 years. So it, it is an unproven technology, requires new infrastructure and high capital you know, in, uh, equipment costs. Um, my understanding from talking to colleagues is it's uh, once people have made that mental leap looking at fuel cells, then actually, and then find out I could actually just use the hydrogen in an ICE, uh, that becomes very interesting um, because now I don't need a battery, I don't need all of the energy, uh, all the battery management systems, the control systems, and things like that. I'm using familiar technology, it's retrofitable, I can convert. Uh, existing engines, I've just got hydrogen tanks to deal with and all of the other issues I, I, I've raised. Uh, it's very, it doesn't care about hydrogen purity, which uh, some fuel cells really do care about. So that's um, um, a saving and from that perspective. So actually could be a, a, a very good uh, use of the hydrogen. Um, the, the other option is to go through ammonia route. You can use ammonia in fuel cells, you can use ammonia in a in a uh, <coughs> internal combustion engine. So, you know, it's again, retrofitable. Um, and so we use all the kind of known and understood service and maintenance, um, looking after IC engines that, that, that folk already understand. Clearly ammonia has some uh, challenges, uh, health being one of them, smell being another one. It doesn't, it only needs low pressure um, low pressure, low pressure pressurization. It is lower density than diesel, but better than hydrogen. Uh, combustion is hard to get going and it's quite slow. So it's likely to need a pilot, but that pilots could be an HBO or a biodiesel or that sort of thing. You will, we will need to have, pay a lot particular attention to the after treat though, to avoid things like a slip. So just then to conclude, um, from my experience from light duty, uh, take a life cycle approach. You need to look at all of the emissions associated with the uh, investment in conversion, the battery packs, the fuel cells, the fuel creation, and look at it as a big picture. It's pointless drawing the system boundary around one small part. There's only one system boundary that matters, and that's the planet. Uh, keep your options open. There isn't a one size fits all. There's no panacea or silver bullet you will need multiple solutions, so don't be told otherwise, unlike automotive. Uh, and it's likely those solutions will change over time, uh, particularly if you bear in mind the existing fleet. In the end, it's all about the area under that curve in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, anything you can do to reduce that now, uh, rather than in the future, is good. 
pulling all of that forward um, to create battery packs and stuff like that could actually be um, more damaging. So do think about how you can do stuff now and help the area under the curve. And to do that, I think sustainable fuels could may play a major part in helping out. But one of the big things is it has to be recognised that it is making that difference. And that, from our legislature, is difficult to get that to happen. Um, but if you can, then it might just reduce and manage the requirements for and the costs associated with new infrastructure, uh, associated with the electricity and the hydrogen that we um, be required. OK, if you're interested, um, when you get the PDFs of these, those should be live links that get you to the white paper and to the OLEV consultation, because I know we're talking rail, but I bet you all drive cars, so you're interested in this stuff. Uh, and feel free to contact me afterwards. OK, that brings me to an end. Steve, thank you ever so much for that really yeah, interesting um, talk. I've moved room because it's too noisy where I was before. Um, but yeah, so what I would like to do, um, again, save your questions if you wouldn't mind for Steve, have those dotted down and, and, and think of something obviously interesting to, to say to Steve, challenging maybe, or you know, have that debate after. Uh, we have our next speaker who is Richard McLean. So uh, I'm delighted to uh, welcome Richard back to the centre. Richard is a former railway division chair. Um, so he's spoken to us before in, in that role. Um, he's been um, joined VR in 1982, I believe, had an incredibly interesting um, career um, since then, um, culminating in uh, time at, um, at GNER, then uh, DB Tyne and Weir, and he's been MD of Grand Central. Um, since 2012. So um, Richard's going to give us his um, his take on decarbonisation from an operator's perspective and, and talk to us about their, his adventures in alternative fuels, I think. So over to you, Richard. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so you've heard the size of the challenge. Um, uh, as an operator, um, we're the people that have got to actually deliver some of this stuff. Um, so just a quick reminder about uh, Grand Central. We're an open access operator. So um, we are doing this on our own as a commercial business. Um, and we need to fit in with that legislative requirement. Um, but we have to do this in a financially sustainable manner. Um, speaking as a taxpayer, I think that's a lesson that would be well um, addressed across the entire industry. Um, we operate in a small way on the East Coast Main Line, um, on, mainly under the wires, uh, but with two very significant uh, non-electrified routes to get us to our final destination uh, and serve the markets uh, and communities that we alone uh, provide direct services to London for. Um, in good times, we run 18 services a day uh, over that, uh, that route. Um, things are a little bit challenged at the moment, as you'll appreciate, but we remain as a strong challenger brand on the East Coast main line. Um, and it's interesting to see that passengers on the East Coast uh, are getting uh, the, the best restart of services um, across the country with longer reservation horizons, um, <coughs> real focus on customer service, because with ourselves, uh, LNER and Hull Trains, passengers have real choice uh, and that is driving higher customer satisfaction across the route. At the rolling stock where the decarbonisation action is, uh, we are operating a fleet of uh, 10 five coach class 180 diesel multiple units. Um, worth noting that these are diesel hydraulic trains, uh, so particularly challenging when we're looking at electric. electric. <coughs> decarbonisation. Uh, we've invested heavily in these trains and these are the rolling stock that is going to see us through the next phases of the growth of our business uh, and uh, both on the existing markets and the opportunity to open up new flows. But as we speak right now we are the only operator of diesel only rolling stock into King's Cross. We're the only people making a noise uh, when the trains are turning round, and this is increasingly noticeable. So as an operator, we have the background of uh, the decarbonisation requirements from legislation uh, and industry strategy, but we've also got a real market position uh, to protect as well. 
So what are we trying to do? Uh, we are trying to clean up our act, but we're trying to evolve what we do uh, towards that zero carbon. Uh, and, and in one of the things we are doing right now is progressing uh, through uh, RSSB funding, a research project, a, a practical demonstration project with a partner, G Gvolution, to convert one of the vehicles on one of our trains to run on dual fuel with liquefied natural gas and diesel together. So background uh, and context into which this sits, as well as our market position, uh, we've heard mentioned twice of the traction network decarbonisation strategy. Um, as you'd imagine, the document produced by Network Rail, it focuses on what we do with the infrastructure. Um, it's a very good report. It, it, it analyzes out a whole variety of options and comes out with a clear central strategy, which as David highlighted, actually produces a, not only a zero carbon end game, but also a relatively positive business case. However, it still requires an awful lot of work to be done. That 13,000 additional single track kilometers of electrification requires between 250 and 450 single track kilometers to be delivered every year. Now that thankfully is within the bounds of possibility. It reflects the type of output rate that we had in the UK when we were embarking on major projects such as the electrification of the East Coast Main Line. However, it has to be sustained over a significant period of time. And when it's finished, it will deliver a 135% increase, the more than doubling the current electrification footprint. But as David has highlighted, um, it is simply not sensible to electrify the entire network. And um, the strategy envisages um, 1,300 uh, 1, single track kilometers of network still being operated, being operated with hydrogen traction and 800 kilometers uh, in battery operation. It also is worth noting that this is all about passengers. Um, there is no identified solution to deliver a decarbonized and financially sustainable freight operation at this point. So to deliver that lot, first of all, we're going to need an awful lot of money. So while it has a positive business case, this, the capital has still has to be put up to deliver that network. It needs us to reestablish the electrification capability we had as an industry. But then in the operator space, and something I'm personally involved in, we need to come up with a plan to completely reconfigure our rolling stock fleets, but also the depots that support those fleets. And we also need to promote our supply chain to develop the tra traction technologies that are required uh, to fulfill the uh, electrification, the electric train operation, but also the hydrogen and the battery train operation. We also need to think about the support of those new technologies in service. We've got an army of people who know about EMUs and we have an army of people who know about diesel engines looking after traction batteries in an operational environment is a different kettle of fish. And looking after hydrogen systems is another new set of skills. When we think about our depot footprint, uh, we know that uh, implementing modern standards in depots and sidings uh, has led to a shortage in capacity can't squeeze as many new trains onto a depot as you can old trains. And if you then electrify as well, you lose more capacity uh, at the same time. So there's an awful lot of thinking to be done. And absolutely central to that thinking is, first of all, to make 
sensible use of the assets that we already have. Um, simply throwing away uh, high performing and very capable assets um, too early would not produce a financially sustainable output outcome. Um, but equally, we need to come up with technologies that work in an operational environment. Looking at the network maps that the decarbonisation strategy presents, it looks highly unlikely to me that we will end up with pure rolling stock, pure hydrogen, pure battery or pure electric. Um, I look at a simple example that's local to where I'm sitting at the moment. The route between York and Harrogate is envisaged to be battery operation, while the route between Harrogate and Leeds is envisaged to be electric. It is extraordinarily unlikely that Northern Rail will want to have a micro fleet of battery only low, uh, vehicles to shuttle backwards and forwards between York and Harrogate and expect all the passengers to hop onto an EMU uh, at Harrogate Station. They will want an electric battery hybrid, uh, but that train is then also very likely to then want to go off onto one of the hydrogen routes. So it feels like we're going to end up with a tri-mode hybrid train of some description. But work needs to be done to come up with the optimal approach. Let's flip back to Grand Central. Um, I went on various courses about uh, environmental awareness and so forth, uh, and was talk, talk, taught the four hours R's principle. And this is what we're deploying as a business. Our first approach is to try and reduce uh, the level of carbon that we're producing because it costs us money. Um, so training our drivers and equipping them with systems to allow them to drive more fuel efficiently, uh, modify our trains to have selective engine shutdown uh, in service and to reduce idling in depots and stations. But it is absolutely essential for us uh, to continue to use the assets that we have all already. So reuse, as they say in NASCAR, you have to run what you brung. Uh, and so we are focusing on trying to use cleaner fuels in the interim until we have exhausted the natural economic life of the assets we have already, maximizing the benefit from the sunk carbon in them uh, and not spending money in advance of need. Again, for our operation, it's extremely likely that we will need 125 mile, uh, mile an hour tri-mode multiple unit. Uh, unfortunately, I went and looked in the shop and there wasn't one on the shelf at the moment. But at the end of the day, we will be recycling, scrapping uh, or cascading the assets we have now. So in the area that we're focusing on right now, which is the reusing our existing assets um, in a more environmentally friendly manner, we're looking to try and find the right technology and in this case, the right fuel. It's a real challenge because, as we've seen from uh, Stephen's talk, you know, diesel is a great fuel. You know, great Dr. Diesel was not an idiot and he's produced a very efficient piece of machinery um, that uses energy uh, in, in an extremely efficient manner. Um, but we've also got to think about, as a, as a business, our um, other emissions particularly in depots and stations, uh, around NOx and around particulates. We've looked at hydrogen, we looked at the mixture of hydrogen and methane, um, and we think there's great opportunities to evolve in that way, but that's for the future. But liquefied natural gas is here and it's available now. We are working uh, with RSSB and with Gvolution and Alstom on converting one vehicle in one of our train sets to operate on a dual basis. We'll be installing fueling equipment at one depot at Crofton. We will secure safety approvals for this train to operate it in passenger service uh, on, on, on the normal railway. 
um, and we're using a small organisation uh, in the Derby area to help us with that using the common safety method. We are designing and implementing and installing the equipment on the train. We're training our drivers to deal with the, this new hardware and we're helping our maintenance contractor, uh, who's now also also, um, to look after the stuff. And we are on track to deliver this uh, into practical operation this summer. It would have been a little bit earlier, but we've been busy dealing with that COVID stuff. Um, this is the here and now. These photographs were taken last week uh, at our, in the supply side, and that is the fuel raft for uh, a class 180. The silver um, torpedoes are the uh, LNG tanks. They are sitting either side of uh, a T-shaped diesel tank. That is a completely self-contained raft that substitutes uh, in the same space envelope and the same weight uh, envelope as the existing diesel tank. Uh, it has um, two fuel connections now for refueling, uh, a diesel connector uh, and an LNG connector. And that tank will allow us at the substitution ratios uh, that we've selected to operate our normal duty cycle and refueling ranges. We have been running uh, a Cummins QSK19 engine in a test cell uh, to optimize the setup uh, of, of, of the engine. Um, this is a standard uh, old school QSK19. It is not a common rail engine. It's using the big cam pumps. Um, we could get better results from a common rail engine, but we're trying to limit our capital investment uh, at this trial stage. The optimum duty cycle, or so the optimum um, results for the Grand Central duty cycle are to substitute 30% of the diesel with LNG. That delivers a 15% uh, CO2 equivalent reduction, but it also delivers us about 50% in particulates reduction. And we're forecasting a fuel cost reduction of between 15 and 20%. We're on track to deliver the first passenger operation of a dual fueled or a cryogenically fueled uh, train uh, in the world. And it's the first practical steps being made to decarbonize an existing DMU. We will be demonstrating the technologies needed for cryogenic fuel storage on trains cryogenic refueling at depots and a complete suite of documentation that will be available to support further rollout and the development of industry standards. Our conclusion, um, we do have as an industry a well-developed network electrification strategy that is now being converted into delivery plans at those routes absolutely must develop a similar plan for rolling stock and depots that aligns with that rollout, but also aligns with how we operate services. We need to develop rolling stock technology solutions that meet the needs of fleet operator fleet requirements. Uh, and that includes the conversion of existing assets as part of the transition program, but also new, new products, particularly for the freight sector. We also need to lay down early industry standards so that the manufacturers know what to build against, uh, particularly in this case, covering uh, traction batteries and cryogenic fuels. But it is absolutely vital, in my view, that any plan for the operator side of this program will have to embed the use of interim technology steps to optimize the economic sustainability 
uh, of the railways as a whole. Um, we saw pictures earlier of the IEPs and talk of Hitachi looking at battery packs to replace uh, engines. There are diesel trains that have been ordered but not yet delivered that will not even have been run in by the time we need to decarbonize. Those assets must form part of a longer term uh, rail operation. So that's my piece. Thank you very much, Richard. So I've had a stop sharing now. Yeah, just <laughs> there we are. The stop sharing thing. <laughs> so that's that's grand. Thank you very much. So if I could ask, um, oh god, his brain's gone. Dave, Dave and Steve, if you wouldn't mind um, coming back onto screen, please. That would be good. Thank you. So fantastic. Um, and so um, following those two presentations, then we'll um, now run a Q and A session. So if I could ask, please, um, if you are um, wanting to ask a question, if you could use the raise hand um, function within um, Zoom so that we can we can find you. Um, that is part of, if you click on the um, little box with the participants and the number 35, 35 at the moment, and um, there is a, in the bottom right hand corner of the box that pops up, there is a raise hand um, facility. And hopefully I will then get to see those and you will be able to, I'll be able to ask you to come on if your name, they were, you know, all of those things, uh, rank number, affiliations, um, and you can ask your question of the panel, please. So, if you've got anything to ask. Actually, Dave, I'm wondering if I might not be able to see that. <laughs> Dave Coxon, are you? Ah, yes, I can. So, um, I've got a couple of people. So, if I go with Ben Scott first, please, Ben, have you got a question? Yeah, hi. Um... I think those, I'm going to flatter people here and probably offend others who are on the call, but um, those are three of the most interesting presentations I've seen in a forum like this. So thank you, everyone. Um, the, the thing that intrigued me most was the, the Scottish um, solution, and there was a route network map, and I got the bits about electrified and to be electrified. Could, um, I think it was Steve, I think, unless I'm getting completely wrong. Um, could you take us through what the other two options are? I think there was one of the routes to Carl Lochausch, you know, from Inverness or something that was... Uh, in a different category. I think it was David. He's Sorry, Dave, yes, I do apologise. Yes. I've offended more people. <laughs> Sorry. Don't worry, Ben, don't worry. Well, what they actually, am I, am I, I am. You're on, you're on the picture. I, I am not muted, that's good. Uh, yeah, what, what the map actually said, it didn't, it, it basically said uh, three things. One is electrified route. One is a final non-electrified solution, which wasn't specified, it could be either battery or it could be uh, uh, or, or it could be hydrogen. And one was a a transitional solution prior to net zero. So that was the Scottish target is to decarbonise by 2035. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't think they'll be able to fully do all the electrification they're required to do by then. So there is a a category that they've said, which is a transitional solution prior to further electrification. But they've, whilst they've said that, for example, the West Island line and the Carvacos line and the line going to Stranra will be a non-electrified solution, at this stage, they're not definitively saying whether that's hydrogen or batteries. Okay, I think that's clearer, thank you. Um, next person. If you happy. look at the the English Sorry. version, if you look at the English version, it's much more definitive. It's electrification, hydrogen, or battery. Long routes like Kyle of Lacalche, in e if they were in England, would show up as hydrogen. Short sections show up as battery. <laughs> and I, I personally, I think the Scottish approach is is better because, frankly, none of us know in 2030, 2035 what the capabilities of batteries, what the capability of hydrogen would be. I think the answer is let's make a start with fleet operation for both. And so we've got a, a feel and a flavor for it. Okay, thank you. Um, so moving on, um, Esme, you've got your hand to ask a question. Yep, hi there. I've got a question for um, Richard about the dual fuel work you're doing with RSSB and Gvolution. That sounds really interesting. Um, first of all, you mentioned you're using the common safety methods. 
for this one. I was wondering, did you have to do any work for interoperability um, or NTSNs or anything like that? Well, that, that's one of the areas where we, we employ people my brains on sticks to do stuff. The reason we had to go for the common safety method is because there are no standards. There are no rules here, so it's all it's all freestyle. Um, the, the common safety, the, you know, we weren't trying to turn this into a full, you know, European interoperable product that we can then sell to anybody. <laughs> um, so the, the whole focus is on ensuring safety on the UK rail operation and particularly on our operation, um, which would then underpin standards. Um, I'm not sure whether in interoperability is, is is allowed anymore that now that we've left our European friends um, but you, you know what what we're trying, what we're aiming for here is to set a suite of UK standards that will mean that somebody can go and buy a replacement fuel tank without having to go through the pain of doing an ab initio demonstration that things that are already in use in many other sectors are safe is what we currently require as a rail industry. So the technology that we're deploying is, is already in your high street. Um, the entire fleet of Waitrose Arctics that deliver to your supermarkets, they're, they're, LN, they're LNG dual fueled. Okay, thanks. And I had where it's coming from. I had one more question, sorry. Um, you mentioned there was a 50% PM reduction, which was very impressive. I'm wondering about if you have any testing protocols for this kind of thing, or if you're testing at a certain notch, or if it's kind of um, replicates real world conditions that we might be facing. Yeah. So um, the, the, the results are coming out from the fuel, uh, sorry, from the test cell results. So the, the engine is on, on the rack there, and it is running um, a program uh, that, uh, that's taken from data recorders from our trains in service. So we know, um, you know, the notching sequence uh, and, and so forth over a normal month's operation. Uh, and then we're replicating that into a test pr protocol. Um, as I understand it, and I'm not um, a, 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 a combustion engineer by any stretch of the imagination. I've bought a few, but I wouldn't know where to start designing one. Um, the particulates reduction is because we're putting less carbon in because there are less C's in methane than there are in, in cetane. Um, and um, the, the highest level of benefit come when you're really putting your foot down. So as you're pulling out of stations um, and accelerating hard, um, which is precisely the point at which our passengers see the smoke. So we're, we're hopeful that we're in the right, in, in the right uh, area. Um, you get you get less benefit when uh, at idling and so forth. Less benefit. Okay, thanks. And then, um, sorry, one more thing. You mentioned about the tri mode train. Yep. I couldn't tell if you were being serious for this or not. If you're oh, kind uh, of dead, dead, on deadly serious. So, so uh, you know, as David demonstrated with his, you know, the picture of the lint. It's already a bi mode. You, you, you know, fuel cells do not drive traction motors. They, they charge batteries and the batteries are, drive the traction motors. So you're already into buy mode operation there. Now, if you've bought one of those in order to, um, you know, go around the Cumbrian, sorry, the, yeah, the Cumbrian coast, because that's a hydrogen route, you do not, if, and you're Northern Rail, you don't want a sub, a mini fleet of those. When, particularly if they're not if they're going to be maintained in Manchester, where everything is going to be 25 kV electrified. So what Northern as an operator will want is a pantograph that they can stick up when there's some there's some copper to rub against and some hydrogen for them to go on their long their long stints. Um, but the batteries come as part of the mix. Feel sensible, David? Yep, sounds good to me. Yeah, there isn't one of those in the shop, is there? <laughs> no, not at the minute. So just, James, I've spotted you putting your hand up physically, so I will come to you in a second. I just wanted to see if Steve had got anything to add to that mix, because I think 
there was a I'm sure I saw a raised eyebrow Steve when Richard was talking about yeah. carbon it's, yeah. it's not really the quantity of carbons you know the energy <laughs> density, the, the, the energy density means you've just got to put more of them in yeah so you just inject more of them it's actually just due to the formation you've got a single pure molecule effectively it's a cleaner burn compared to diesel which is made up of lots of different hydrocarbons of long chain which some burn well some burn not so well and uh, you run them rich and lean and uh, it's the it's the formation of complex it's the burning of the complex hydrocarbons that results in some of them not burning very well uh, contamination with oil and all of those sorts of things that result in the, in the particulates. So you're right. Yes, yes uh, but not me, for the right reason. <laughs> me, methane will, will, will generally. Yeah, I'm, glad I picked, um, I'm glad I picked up on that. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think one, one other comment I had to make, which is, do please I, be careful because auto's fallen into this trap as well about net zero and what does it mean. As far as the government is concerned, net zero draws a system boundary around the country. So anything that we um, offshore in terms of production doesn't count. So all of those batteries that are being made and the reason, you know, you're saying, yes, you've, you, you effectively have got a battery pack with your fuel cell. Um, it's like an accumulator. It's there as the, the buffer to recover, to store recovered energy into and to provide the the particularly rapid demand. You should be able to run the fuel cell direct if you're on a steady state cruise type condition, but it's there as the buffer. Um, the more electric mile, pure electric miles you want to do, the bigger the battery is, the bigger the battery is, the more carbon that you've produced uh, by a lot in the production of those packs. And those are all currently made, all the cells are all made outside the country. And so as far as the government's concerned from a life cycle perspective, that's all fine because it's offshore. So be really careful when you're doing your life cycle analysis. When anybody says net zero, first question is, what do you mean by net zero? Where's your system boundary? And as engineers, we should be asking those questions. Just make an observation about particulates um, and rails credentials. You know, while people get very excited about particulates, rail and particularly where you've got a diesel train in the station um, when they've done the air quality sampling at King's Cross um, the air inside King's Cross station is polluted by the Euston Road not by my trains yeah, and there's a lot to be done but you know there are such things as diesel particulate filters uh, most modern after treatment on the road is down to levels where you get into the point where and certainly the Euro 7 proposals are Actually, I couldn't tell where this has come from. You're at background levels of NOx, particulates, all of that stuff. So, uh, um, yeah, there is after treatment available that would make a huge difference to what you're doing now. Thank you. David, do you quickly want to add anything to any of that? Again, I've seen you. There might have been one or two little, oh, maybe I want to add some things. No. <laughs> Okay, so I'll, I'll move in that case. I'll move to James because James, you did put your hand up while Richard was talking in response to Esme's question. Oh, I think you're on mute, James. We can't hear you, or I can't anyway. Just got to deploy, I've just got to deploy my <laughs> microphone. <it. laughs> um, responding to Esme's question, I'm working on the standards issue as, as we speak, actually trying to concentrate on both at the same time. Um, NTSNs or, or TSIs as they were called. Um, this, this project started when TSIs were still uh, in, in requirement. The, the, the project wasn't significant enough to require uh, TSIs. Uh, so we didn't go down that, you, Richard didn't, didn't go down that route because it wasn't required. Uh, and also going down the NTSIs wouldn't have given you any more than going for the regular UK standards. Um, so that provided no benefit, additional pain and wasn't necessary. Um, and, and as Richard noted in terms of standards, yes, there aren't any standards in the rail industry. Um, there are standards outside the rail industry. Um, obviously, they're not entirely appropriate for trains. Um, so it involves a bit of um, fiddling and, and interactions with the CSM in order to make sure that those standards that are available can be applied logically, sensibly and appropriately to the rail industry. Ideally, obviously, we'd have our own set of standards for, 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 um, for batteries, for uh, alternative fuels and for anything else we'd like to implement to reduce the carbon footprint of the rail industry. So uh, as, a, as a potential customer for rolling stock products with big batteries 
and, high, and cryogenic fuels on them. I just want to be able to buy one off the shelf. I do not want to be at the leading edge of standards development <laughs> while my arse is hanging out on a business plan. Yeah. Well put, Richard, thank you. So I'm gonna move on um, now. So Ian Wormsley, you had your hand up uh, for a little while. So over to you. Hello, oh, sorry about the strange sun patterns there. They weren't there earlier. Um, yeah, Richard, I must say that I've heard of green hydrogen and hydrogen trains and so on. And, but surely the most radical proposal of the evening was your suggestion of scrapping the competitive market in rolling stock and bringing in a programmed approach to stock procurement. First remarkable thing. So I'd like to know how you're going to do that. And also a question for Steve, which is um, how are you going to educate the government in the wonderful numbers that you gave us this evening? because Network Rail told me with their decarbonisation strategy that the only reason there's so much hydrogen in it is because otherwise the government won't take any notice of it. So how are you going to get the message across? Okay, Who do you want to go, want first? To go first? Let's get Richard to go first. <laughs> so it, it, if we're going to do any of this in a financially sustainable manner, it has to be through, through a supply chain and a market um, we have to make uh, allow the owners of existing assets to make best use of those um, because we're kind of paying for them. Um, we need to make best use of the stuff that we've already ordered, but um, uh, metal is still being cut on. Um, and then by being clear about what the industry wants, you know, how much of what, where and when, then the supply chain should be able to organise itself to be able to give us a cost-effective solution. It's got to be market-based. Um, when we've not let the market deliver competitively, um, we've ended up with some products that we'll spend 40 years regretting. You've got some of them. In, 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 what, in the 180s? <laughs> I get them very cost-effectively because nobody else wants them. I bet you did. Yeah. But, you know, the, the, um, th uh, the work on the rolling stock strategy must be industry wide. Um, I know exactly how we will get a good economic solution. Um, but uh, I'm a taxpayer. I'd really much like to make sure that we don't turn um, all the promise of rail growth uh, into a desert by making it too expensive. Um, if you just take the, the, the freight sector. You know, they need 600 new locos. Yeah. If we don't get that right, we're going to end up with rail freight being completely un uncompetitive compared to a decarbonized heavy goods network. Where I saw a report just recently that's showing that uh, uh, HGVs, if supported by a high speed charging network, will be more cost effective than diesel HGVs. So Richard, can I, can I go in there? Is it possible to have a rolling stock strategy without an infrastructure strategy? Well, we start with the, from the TDNS. And, well, but and, I mean, the, the government has yet to respond to that. Uh, yeah. And the signs, and that's what, six months, seven months now, I think. Uh, you know, until there is a defined government strategy, is it possible to have a rolling stock strategy? Yeah. Well, the first step is address what you know, what, what's on the table, but do yeah. it in a way that allows you to then adjust the rolling stock plan okay. to different network strategy. Shall I go? Optimization. Thank okay. you. So, Steve, do you want to take the question about getting government to take notice? Yeah, it's an uphill struggle. Um, I personally think it's the sort of thing that the IMAC should be doing a lot more of in terms of uh, putting forward policy statements. It's why I stood up and wrote this bloody thing. Um, and that did result in Olev reaching out to us specifically to contribute to the consultation, which we did. Um, and we had plenty of um, decent conversations with Olev around that. Uh, they did listen to some extent in that uh, they did allow the hybrids to 
um, be part of the solution, but unfortunately it rather backfired and they just pulled that as a forward date. So then they brought forward the date to hybrids only and BEVs to 2030. Uh, the BEVs only and fuel cell only stayed at 2035. So in the end, you could say it actually got worse, but it did kind of follow the, 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 the what we were saying. Um, it depends on where it is in level of maturity and which government departments that you're talking to. But if it was me doing all of this again, I would have tried a lot harder earlier on to do the life cycle analysis and use that as evidence to convince the government, no, look at these different scenarios and look at the difference they make. Yeah. And then use that as the input, you know, proper evidence driven um, stuff that would then support the generation of a, of a policy. Uh, all very marvellous to say and easy to say and very difficult to do. Um, the other thing is the uh, Committee for Ch Climate Change um, seem to be able to just say what's going to happen. Um, and it is quite difficult to get them influenced as well. But those would be the two, the two prongs that I, I would do if I had my time again. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you for that question, Ian, and, and to the three speakers for their responses. Um, Martin Elliott, we've got a, a hand up from you. So you've got a question. Uh, yeah, hi, thanks, Rachel. Thanks, thanks for the speakers. It's very much more mundane question, I'm afraid, compared with uh, Ian's. But it's a question to Richard. Uh, I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit, please, about the changes at the depots to facilitate a new fuel being there. And uh, how does the fuel get there? Is it delivered by road tanker? Uh, how's it stored? Are there any issues there? Are there any maintenance issues associated with the changes? So the... Um... The fuel unit we're using is a modular one. Um, it, it's the type of thing that you'll you'll see at um, supermarkets that offer uh, LNG refueling. Um, it's a it's effectively a, a, a self-contained um, shipping container um, which has a gas tank and a dispensing point uh, and metering unit and a hose reel on it. Um, we, you have to plonk it down relatively close to where your train is. Um, you can't pump uh, LNG uh, to miles across the depot, across the yard from the fuel tanks to the, um, to the dispensing point. So there's some interesting logistics to deal with in some of our locations. But at Crofton, uh, we've got a nice flat piece of concrete where we can put the train next to the tank and run the hose across. Um, refueling is pretty rapid, as I think David saw with the hydrogen um, in, in, um, uh, on the lint. Um, and having filled up the LNG tanks on my um, motorhome uh, for the cooking, um, it's pretty easy to do. Thanks. You've muted yourself, Rachel. My apologies. So I was just going to say, David, you've got your hand up. Is that intentional? Yes, it is intentional. Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't want any special favours being a panel member. You know. I, no, uh, right. Question for Steve. Actually, you mentioned the Committee for Climate Change. Uh, I studied their net zero report, and what they seem to be saying. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is that Truly net zero fuels are very much a finite resource. And off memory, I think they estimated something like a third of current petroleum production. And what the net zero report basically said was that because they're such a limited resource, they should be used in sectors for which there isn't a net zero solution, which effectively is, is aviation. So on that basis, should we be considering biofuels for rail traction uh, or to replace internal combustion engines on the road? Uh, you, you're, you, you're right, they have made those sorts of uh, comments, although uh, something just landed and I've not had a chance to read yet um, on um, particularly biomass um, availability. It, it was really the biomass that they were fretting about. 
because um, theoretically from a synthetic or an e-fuel basis you can just make what you need uh, in the same way you can make as much hydrogen as you need um, the biomass the biofuel routes require a biomass to drive them um, and that was their concern in the study we did uh, there's been some sums that kind of allocated this biomass and the biofuels to different sectors. We only worked within our sector. We didn't rob anything from heavy duty or rail or aviation or anything. Um, and so we think it we think it works and it does work. But the the bit everybody that the CCC don't seem to be able to handle is that we don't have to do all of it all at once. Yeah, you know, the whole point about you know a lot of the biofuels is they can be blended with conventional fossils. So we can actually start with 25% bio and 70% yeah. fossil. And we can gradually increase that over time. And, but I, and, and actually, because of the electrification of light duty, that demand for the biomass will go up as we uh, increase the blend. But then we're going to drive more and more electric miles. So actually it drops right off. All of these graphs are in that O-level consultation because we did all of these sums just at the time when aviation will probably need to be ramping up significantly because they're a long way from being ready. They're just making a lot of noise for sustainable aviation fuels. Same for heavy duty um, uh, goods, heavy goods vehicles and things like that. So actually, if you do it right, you stimulate the investment, the scale, the efficiency gains now. You start to grow and scale that up. You use it in light duty to begin with, and then that will drop away as it does more electric miles. And you've now got the industry ready to service heavy goods vehicles, uh, marine and uh, aviation. And I think rail could hang on to the hang on to that. I'm just very interested that but I'd, I'd love to ask a question. And, and that would be it appears that nobody's talking about sustainable fuels. Richard did a presentation right now on using um, a direct replacement fuel that happens to reduce the carbon footprint. If that liquefied natural gas was actually based on biomethane, yeah, off you go. You're actually now at very low carbon levels. You could even be carbon negative because if that was fugitive methane, I, methane that was going to escape into atmosphere and if that methane escapes into the atmosphere it's about 25 times worse greenhouse gas than burning it and turning it into co2 yeah um over a hundred year period it's a, it's a it's equivalency of co2 is about 25 um it, you could actually make a huge difference right now and it just strikes me and i don't understand is is it that you're not allowed to think about this. You know, rail doesn't want to think about this or it, it, it just, what's the, what are the barriers for starting, just at least starting with this and making a difference now? So Steve, I mean, just, just uh, coming back with that, that is exactly what's in the back of my head. Uh, I want to demonstrate methane operation. I want to demonstrate that. I know that I, you know, eventually I'll be able to buy lower carbon or carbon neutral um, alternative fuels for the liquid part. Uh, and I can see where I can get the um, carbon neutral methane from. Um, you know, I, I, need to, I need to find a cost effective, financially sustainable solution for my business. But you also need that, that carbon neutrality to count. Yes. Yeah, That's because you will still produce CO2 at point of use. No, that, that upset, understood. And that's the bit when you draw the box around the point of use only, you miss all of that opportunity and it becomes a ruled out technology. And you're just thinking, yeah. but I could be making a massive difference right now, but it's not allowed. Nobody gets a benefit for it. And that's the challenge. Sorry, David, did that answer your question? No, it, it did very well. And, and, and in a sense, to answer yours, I think the problem is the, the big focus is on the end game. You know, what do we need to do to get the 20? What, what should be happening in 2050, as in 85% yeah. electrification. But so we sit on we're our hands. We're, we put, we're not putting the same amount of thought and focus into what the transitional solution should be. I mean, I'd, I'd compliment uh, Richard for what he's, he's doing on, uh, on his 180s. I think it's a, a great thing. And we, and we have all this kit out there that something's got to be done with. And... Uh, yeah, I find your presentation really quite fascinating, but I've, I must admit I've kind of discounted biofuels on my reading of the CCC report, so I shall uh, 
look at them with fresh eyes now. Okay, thank you. I'm um, conscious of um, the time and that we've been going for more than an hour and a half um, now. So um, I'm going to, Ace, me, I've spotted that you've got your hand up. I'm going to wrap up, I'm afraid. So you've had a question already. So I'm sorry about that. Um, Can I make just one final comment? Oh, yes. Sorry. Of course. Um, just a, a bit of a plug. We've talked a lot about hydrogen. So the University of Nottingham is putting together a proposal at the moment for an East Midlands Hydrogen Innovation Zone which is technology agnostic, doesn't matter how you, what you want to use your hydrogen for, but it's meant to be a kind of research area to look at the whole life cycle, looking at the different methods of making hydrogen, the different methods of using hydrogen to help you answer what's the best solution for my application, you know, without being told what the answer is. So um, rail is one of the applications that we are particularly keen on. Um, we may be talking to a few of you in the, in, the, in, in the not too distant future, but if you're interested in finding out more about the East Midlands and Hydrogen Innovation Zone, let me know. Interesting. Okay, thank you um, for that, Steve. So I'm, um, I'm going to wrap up there just by um, saying thank you very much to you all for giving up your time for us at, um, at the Midlands Centre this evening. So we really appreciate um, the three different um, aspects of the decarbonisation challenge that you've uh, spoken to us about. And, and thank you also for a really good sort of panel debate as well. And the, the good interaction between yourselves actually is, is, you know, again, help fill in some of the gaps and, and, um, and obviously educated us all. And I think every day is a school day. <laughs> Richard, you may have learned something as well. <laughs> so it's... Um, yeah so it's it's one of those things where you kind of get yeah great benefit actually to bring in the three of you together so really do appreciate it and thank you very much for that so um just going to hand over i think now um if i can i'm going to shut up and hand over to our chair jason um assuming jason you are there yes you are fantastic so i'll hand over to you for the rest of the wrapping up thanks rachel um first of all apologies to um steve david and richard and Richard, good to good to see you again. I unfortunately I had, a, I had a work commitment that I couldn't get out of, so I wasn't able to join. But the uh, the this is being recorded, so I will go back and listen to all of the all the lectures. I, I miss David and Steve's, but it sounds like it's been a really good session. So thank you very much for that. Um, what unfortunately we're doing it in the wrong order, but I just want to very quickly um, run through the AGM points um, at least to announce the 